Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. As millions of students get ready to head back to their studies overseas, this week we'll be finding out what impact the COVID pandemic is having on their plans for university. The true cost of an education is studying abroad worth the money in a socially distanced world. We'll find out why some universities are getting ready for takeoff. They're chartering special flights to get their international students back. And the new normal, what will student life be like in the midst of a pandemic? Europe's universities have been given two unexpected assignments this term, the pandemic and Brexit. And they've had to adapt their courses to a new normal, with their overseas intake key to their budgets. More than 1.3 million international students come to Europe from around the world to study, making up 61% of all internationally mobile students in Europe's universities. The UK is the biggest player in Europe when it comes to hosting international students. In fact, it's second only to the US in attracting them. They contribute around $30 billion to the UK economy every year. But COVID-19 means 230,000 fewer students will enter British higher education this year, more than half of which are international students. Losing those would mean a fall in income of around $2 billion. So what do students actually pay for? Well, their tuition fees cover core costs. That's teaching, libraries, work placements, and access to support and relevant technology and equipment. But as lectures move online, some students, especially on practical courses, are demanding discounts and almost 300,000 people have signed a petition calling for refunds. In most of Northern Europe, including Germany, tuition fees are free. In France, until last year, international students paid the same as their French peers, but now pay 10 times more, around $3,000. Still substantially lower than the UK, where international students pay up to $50,000 a year for their studies. Paying far more than their British classmates doesn't seem to deter Chinese students, though. Last year, 120,000 of them were enrolled on UK higher education courses, around a third of its total foreign intake. But as the pandemic uncertainty continues, universities could be looking at some empty classes and certainly lost revenues. Although some are chartering private planes to fly in their overseas students. The end of term report from the Institute for Fiscal Studies makes for worrying reading. It estimates at least 13 universities in Britain are facing financial ruin because of COVID-19. With travel restrictions and quarantine measures still in place around the world due to the pandemic, universities have been taking some extreme measures to make sure their new and returning students make it into their country in time for the beginning of term. The University of Bolton is no exception. Joining me now is its Vice-Chancellor, Professor George Holmes. Uh, Professor, how has the pandemic affected recruitment for the new academic year? I mean, it's been an interesting time, this, because, of course, we've still had a lot of demand, in fact, probably more demand internationally in the UK than we've had for many years. Uh, but it's delivering that demand that's the issue. It's ensuring that those students can actually make it to the UK and actually, you know, participate on campus in those programmes. So we at Bolton have got a, a COVID-secure campus. We were the first in the UK to, to launch that in terms of a, an awful lot of uh, social distancing and proper measures to ensure students are safe. But our big issue now is getting those students across the border and into the UK. So what are you doing to bring them over? Well, we thought we'd be a little bit innovative here, and we've spoken with our partners at Manchester Airport. Uh, and we intend to um, either block book, or indeed, uh, at this stage, we've got a blocking for a charter um, to send a, a plane both to, uh, to to China and to India, to uh, to Shanghai and to, to Delhi, uh, with a view that those would come in as a single bubble. Because if we take a, a full jet, which will be around 300 students, uh, then they become a, a, a quarantine bubble for when they enter the UK. Um, so we can meet them at the airport uh, in their uh, departure destination, uh, sorry, the departure location, and bring them to their destination here in, in Manchester and then uh, ship them off on university coaches to university accommodation that then allows them to be in a bubble for 14 days before they actually join the campus. And that keeps them COVID secure. 
Is that only Bolton University, or have other universities signed up to this? Well, we, we put this out as the first sort of idea, and then a number of other universities have started to work with us on that. Um, and so there's a, there's a sort of Northwest consortium now trying to bring this together uh, as a combined uh, group of universities. Uh, but whether that happens or not, Bolton will, would go ahead if we need to. I mean, clearly, if, if commercial flights open up quickly, but they're not doing it at the minute from those destinations, if they do, then clearly we can stand that particular option down. But at this stage, we're, we're wanting to go ahead with that to ensure that students have really got access to the UK. How many do you think have signed up so far? In terms of students, we've got 160 students currently signed up on this. Um, and clearly, you can change the size of your jet. So you can go from anything from a sort of 80-seater through to a sort of 300-plus-seater. Um, and so at this moment in time, we've got a, we've got a, we've got a, a decent cohort. Uh, Chinese students, uh, international students, pay higher fees. Is that why you're so keen for them to come? No, I think we're, I mean, we're clearly in business, of course. All universities in, uh, in the UK and, indeed, the US and Australia are in business in that sense. Uh, but it's more important to us to have the diversity on campus, to have the range of experiences. Um, you know, people like to see... They don't want to see too many international students, but they don't want to see none at all. They want to see that mix of student body so that you get a, a nice diversity. So in an ideal world, which is the normal state of affairs pre-COVID, you know, you'd have students from multiple destinations uh, significant cohorts from both China and fr from India. In terms of, we're talking hundreds here, not thousands, uh, but that gives a, a campus feel, uh, a much more uh, cosmopolitan feel to a campus. And then what's really important, and I've said this before on, on, on other uh, um, shows, I've, I've talked about the, the importance for the cultural transfer back to those countries, because what you find then is students go back to the, the countries when they've been to a British university, whichever British university they've been to, and of course they are favourable in international trade terms to the UK PLC then. They're, you know, they're friends for life of the UK, and when it comes to awarding big contracts, these people often get great jobs in their, their home countries, and then UK businesses really benefit. So there's a lot of downstream benefit from international students, as well as the cultural diversity, as well as, the yes, the income to the universities, but the income to the country long term, and the cultural capital is enormous. You've been uh, an academic for a long time. Has academia, uh -huh. has academia changed from being a pure uh, academic study to a business? And what's the downside well, you know, of, of, of having to run a business in uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, there I was thinking I was looking young at 30 plus <laughs> years in the sector, but uh, uh, clearly it, it shows that I've been in the sector a long time. Um, it's definitely become uh, more focused uh, on, on the commercial side of the world, the, the academic world. Clearly, we have to operate in a commercial context. We're autonomous, we're self-managing businesses, we're not an arm of the state. And in that sense, we have to operate uh, professionally and commercially. That's why, you know, student satisfaction is so important to my university. We're a top five in Britain for student satisfaction in the student surveys recently, the last two years running. And that's important that our customers are satisfied because they are customers. As well as getting a great education, they've got to be treated well. And they've got to have the right level of student support. And so, yes, it is becoming more and more commercial. But that's a good thing because it means that we satisfy the need of our customer. Because, you know, when I first joined the higher education business, uh, I don't want to be too critical of the sector at the time, but it was very much a case of this is what we offer, this is what we deliver, take it or leave it. This is 30-plus years ago. And now it's, you know, what does the student need? What can we offer them? How can we provide them with better facilities? How can we give them a better education? How can we ensure that they get what they, they need for their employment for the future? Those are becoming more and more important as part of that business operation. And what other incentives are you offering uh, to bring those students over? Um, I mean, there, there are scholarships, uh, not large numbers of scholarships, but there are scholarships, um, a vice chancellor scholarship, a chancellor scholarship, a number of other um, supported, uh, funded bursaries uh, that students can apply for. This is based on academic excellence, so a student who's got a particular academic profile who wants to join an advanced performance engineering course, there are some uh, scholarships offered by, uh, by some um, people in the industry there uh, so they could apply for those. Um, similarly, there are some ac accommodation bursaries. Those are available too, not in large number, but they are available for those students who've got um, outstanding academic profiles. Is it still good value, three years at university, with all the debts they will incur afterwards? Well, you're talking to the right person, because I'm an economist by original training, so I'm interested in the economics of education. You know, what's it worth? Um, it is still the best investment you'll ever make. You know, most people see their house as a major investment if they buy a house and a long-term growth. 
Uh, with higher education, you get a massive return on your investment over your life cycle on average. So the data's around there. It changes year on year, but on average, someone who's a graduate will earn around a quarter of a million pounds more in their lifetime than someone who's not a graduate. And that still exists as an, as an average figure. Now, obviously, some will earn millions more, some very little more. And of course, that will depend on the industry they've chosen. If you've chosen to go into one of the great healthcare professionals like nursing, you may find that the, uh, the cash returns are not as high as if you went into stockbroking, for example. Um, and that's a personal judgment. But uh, clearly, the, the benefits to society of that return on that investment are enormous if someone goes into nursing. So you've got a lot of issues around this in terms of, very simply, there's nothing better for you in terms of your, your mental health, your well-being, your, your physical health, your contribution to society than investing in doing a degree at whichever university you go to, wherever in the world, to be honest. It's a, it's a great thing to do for your, for, for your, your, your own well-being. Um, but in terms of financial return, the evidence shows a UK higher education um, qualification a degree does give you lifelong earnings on average, which are much higher than if you hadn't. And if I said to you, I want you to invest 50,000 and your return is 250,000, you'd probably buy the investment. Professor George Holmes, Vice-Chancellor of Bolton University, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So that's the view from one British university. But what about those international students planning to leave their homes to head overseas and study this year? With me now in Xi'an, in China's Shanxi province, is 19-year-old Wang Hie Tong, who will be studying digital media and society at Sheffield University here in the UK. Um, Wang Hie Tong, why did you decide to study here in the UK? What's the attraction? I come from Xi'an, China, and it is a city with a long and old history. And growing up in such a city, it's, it is difficult not to be influenced by China's rich culture, right? And UK is also a country with a profound cultural heritage. And I'm longing for the cultural collision that this country may bring to me. And of course, the ancient European architecture in Britain, such as the cathedrals, which you can see them everywhere, is also one of the reasons that attracted me to study in this country. So it's the culture of, of the UK. But do you think in the current crisis it's, it's value for money? I think, uh, well, for an ordinary family like me, the cost of study in the UK is indeed a relatively big expense. But compared to the complete hardware facilities and plentiful educational resources of universities in UK, these investments are still worthwhile, I think. And, um, and in such crisis, I think um, if we can still have online classes, I think it's still worthwhile for me to study here. And yeah. You were in the UK last year, weren't you? Were you concerned when COVID happened that you wouldn't be able to come back and finish your studies? Honestly, I didn't think so much at that moment. I returned to China in mid-May, and during that time, the COVID-19 pandemic situation in the UK had already under control, and the friends around me who are still in the UK are not as flustered as when the pandemic first started. And when I decided to return to China, I thought that the pandemic would pass when school started in September and I could still return to university in the UK as usual. But I didn't expect the pandemic to increase again. What about your family? They must be very worried about you coming all the way to the UK. If I know that the the COVID-19 is longer than what we thought. Uh, maybe my family is still expect me to uh, return to home because I think during this crisis, um, they prefer me to stay with the family and spend a difficult time with them. The possibility of virtual classes, socially distanced virtual classes even, uh, that must be a great disappointment to you. Face-to-face -face communication in the learning process is very important. And even if the school has complete network teaching facilities, it cannot make up for the lack of face-to-face -face teaching. And staying at home for a long time will also make us to lose the motivation to learn to some extent. And we can't use many of the school's facilities, such as libraries and well-equipped laboratories. And this is a loss for international students who have traveled so far to the UK to study. 
tell us a little more about the logistics, about how you plan to come back to the UK, flights and everything else. I mean, it must be quite difficult, quite complex. At the end of July, we received an email from the university saying that the University of Manchester and seven other universities had launched a questionnaire on internet uh, on uh, interest in charter flights. This charter flight project is a uh, like collaboration between the seven universities and Hainan Airlines. But however, like the current charter flight project is still at the stage of willingness investigation, I think. And as a student, I didn't receive other further information. And I think the implementation of this project is definitely not an easy task for school. Yeah, and the university and the government. I think they are definitely have been working hard on this matter so far. And what about your friends uh, at university? Are, are they coming back to the UK? What, what kind of arrangements are being made? I think um, most of my friends are still plan to come back to the UK, but some of them, maybe their parents are very worried about them and they may choose to like defer or get for a year or maybe like they just choose to stay at home to get um, online classes for the first semester. Wang Yutong, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much for this interview. Still to come here on the agenda. Life in the bubble. We'll hear more about how universities are making sure their international students stay safe. The world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to the agenda. As the number of COVID cases in Europe starts to go up again, there will be many concerned students as well as their families worrying about whether or not to make the journey back to their universities. So what exactly are those institutions doing to put their minds at rest and get them back into their lecture halls? With me now is the Senior Pro Vice Chancellor for Education at Cambridge University, Professor Graham Virgo. Uh, Professor, what has Cambridge done to try and attract more students from overseas, especially China, given uh, the current pandemic? Well, what we have been doing for uh, a number of months uh, is to make it clear that we want to be open for education business uh, as usual as much as we possibly can. We realise that there are students who will have concerns about travelling to another country uh, and coming to a, a university such as Cambridge. And so one thing we've particularly focused on is what we've called a, a public health campaign called Stay Safe uh, Cambridge Uni, which really emphasizes all the different things that we are putting in place uh, to make Cambridge as safe as we possibly can. Can you tell us a little more about those Stay Safe measures? Yes, the, there are a, a variety of, of things. I mean, one thing to emphasize is that uh, Cambridge University is a collegiate university. 
so that our students join one of the 31 colleges in Cambridge. And for many students, the college is their home and provides accommodation and uh, support and education for them. And so the university and the colleges have been working very closely together, uh, looking at all our spaces, accommodation and food spaces and teaching spaces to make them as safe as possible. We are expecting face coverings to be worn inside uh, and we've developed a, a testing system as well. And it's also worth emphasizing that we were one of the first universities in the United Kingdom to say that our lectures would be going online. Uh, so lectures will be recorded, but we want there to be a significant amount of face-to-face -face teaching in small groups, because that's a really important part of, of education at Cambridge. And we're ensuring that that small group teaching uh, is conducted in, in a very safe way. What does Cambridge and other universities in Britain do then that is so different from universities in the rest of Europe? What singles the UK out? Well, certainly the UK ha has a, an incredibly strong reputation in the quality of its education provision. Also, a, a number of uh, other European countries, their universities have very large numbers of students. Some of our universities in the UK are very big, but a significant number, like Cambridge, uh, admits about 19,000 students. It has 19,000 students. So we're not an incredibly big university. And that means as well that the, uh, the city of Cambridge, with its colleges and with its faculties and departments, is really well suited to look after the interests of those individual students. The UK is second only to, uh, I think, the US in attracting uh, overseas students. As there is increasing tension between the US uh, and China and concerns about the pandemic, certainly in America, uh, is this an opportunity for you to attract more Chinese students? Frankly, yes, it is. Uh, and we know we are doing that. Uh, we have a very significant number of Chinese students already at Cambridge, and actually the highest number who have been uh, admitted to Cambridge for our new uh, academic year. And we certainly want to encourage more international students, and particularly students from China, uh, to come to the UK and particularly come to Cambridge University to benefit from the education we can offer. Uh, we have long-standing relationships with institutions in China, and we really want to continue developing those. One of those is the Nanjing Centre for Technology, isn't it? Uh, an innovation. It is. uh, are, are you yes. planning more opportunities uh, for Chinese students to get a Cambridge education without perhaps the need to leave China? Actually, we are not. We regard it as a very significant feature of a Cambridge education that our degree programmes are resident in Cambridge. It is Cambridge where we have the, the academic staff and we have the resources, incredible libraries, uh, incredible uh, scientific laboratories for our students to, to learn to be taught and to, to conduct research. So we are not changing that residential model. What we are doing, however, is rapidly expanding our online education. We're not offering online degree programmes, but we are offering many more um, education programmes, which will certainly be of benefit to students in China uh, who wish to remain in China. I know there were uh, delays uh, to the IELTS, uh, uh, especially. They must have caused all kinds of problems, not least for the administrators. Uh, it, it has indeed, and my colleagues have been working incredibly hard uh, responding to that. 
we are well aware that there have been particular concerns in China about the IELTS and about visa applications, etc. We have been monitoring that very, very carefully. Uh, we understand things are improving very quickly, and we've been really flexible with our deadlines and providing support to applicants and offer holders to make sure they get the advice and guidance that we need. We are doing everything we can to ensure that students who have met all the conditions for entry will be able to come to Cambridge. When the pandemic uh, first began, there were some incidents of uh, abuse against Chinese students uh, because they were held responsible uh, for COVID-19, which is pretty unfair uh, by any, uh, any means. But w what actions have you been taking at Cambridge to try and prevent any future abuse? Well, first of all, let me say um, any perception uh, about the responsibility of China unfair and any behaviour involving um, harassment or criticism of Chinese students totally unacceptable. And, and we have a no tolerance policy relating to such um, harassment and we have very clear messages going out to all our students about respect and appropriate behaviour. And if we came across examples of unacceptable behaviour on those lines, we would respond appropriately. Taking flights to the UK isn't easy. Uh, are you planning to organise some flights yourselves? Uh, what arrangements are you making? What we have said is that any student, uh, and particularly any Chinese student, who is unable to get to the UK and to Cambridge for the start of the academic year, uh, we will give them permission to study remotely until they are able to get to Cambridge. And we're putting a, a, a lot of support in for um, teaching which can be provided remotely. It is not perfect. Uh, we, we do regard uh, being in Cambridge as being the, the best way to get the most out of a Cambridge education. But for those students who cannot get to Cambridge, uh, we will do all we can to bring Cambridge to them. Professor Virgo, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you very much. Student life in 2020 will involve restrictions like never before. Lectures will be virtual, desks in libraries will need to be spaced out, and everyone's social lives will have to be properly socially distanced. And that will give many parents uh, and students pause, especially those planning to go abroad to study. Are the tens of thousands of dollars a year it costs to study overseas really worth it? It's the big question, especially once we factor in a recent report from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which suggests a fifth of all graduates are actually worse off after their studies than they would have been had they not gone to university. These are quite simply questions universities around the world can't afford people to ask. International students are worth more than $5 billion a year to British universities alone. And if any proportion decide to stay at home, that would cause a funding crisis, the likes of which we've never seen before. Indeed, there's a warning that 13 universities in the UK could go out of business in the next few months if overseas students stay away. But the truth is, as with so many things in these uncertain pandemic times, that it'll only be once the new terms start around the world that students will know what a COVID education really looks like. And that might mean more focus on studying and less on the social side of university life. Coming up on a future agenda, why the relationship between China and the European Union could be the key to a new form of multilateralism. And don't forget, for more agenda content, you can visit our website or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>